Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Film House and to this screening of You've Been Trumped. How fantastic to see such a great turnout on such a revolting, dreary evening. Um, my name is Jenny Leesk. I'm part of the programming team here. And uh, I should warn you that this film is going to make you very angry indeed. Um, we're delighted that the director of the film is here. He's going to be here for Q&A after the screening. I know that you're all going to stay for that because there are questions you're going to want to ask. In the meantime, he's going to introduce the film. Please welcome Anthony Baxter. Well, good evening. Thank you very much, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, really appreciate you coming tonight. And I'd like to thank the Edinburgh Film House uh, for showing the film. Um, it's a struggle getting films out and distributed, and we've certainly had our battle with this one right from the start. I think there's probably a few crowdfunders in the audience tonight. Anybody help us with the crowdfunding? I know there are, and that was basically how we made the film, that and me remortgaging the house. Uh, because we couldn't get any, um, any funding to make it. Just very briefly, I'll tell you more about the whole process afterwards, I'm sure, if any of you want to hear that. But uh, I live in Montrose on the East Coast, so just, um, just south, obviously, of where Donald Trump announced he was going to be building his golf course resort. And I live in Montrose because at the risk of sounding like Donald Trump, my mother uh, is from Scotland, or was from Scotland. Um, and... I used to go there every year as the three of us as children went to Montrose every summer. Uh, and we didn't have memories of cagoules and uh, umbrellas. We had memories of long summer days on the, uh, on the beach in Montrose. And so I moved there eight years ago. And I felt uh, when this story began to unfold of Donald Trump uh, building his golf course or the plan to build the golf course resort, I felt very frustrated about the way the story was being portrayed in the media, and particularly the two local newspapers in Aberdeen, the Press and Journal and the Evening Express, seemed to be portraying the story as if it was a fantastic thing for Scotland, it was going to bring all these jobs. Nobody seemed to be investigating the environmental uh, impact, and also I felt that the the local people were being, to a certain extent, caricatured by, by the media. And so I tried to get funding to make the film and failed at every hurdle. Um, and it was a very, very frustrating process, but I felt it was an important story, and I felt that somebody had to document what was happening. And that's really why I decided to make the film. And as I said, remortgage the house, hit the internet to raise the rest of the money from hundreds of people from around the world not just in Scotland, but all over, the, all over the world, who felt that this was an important story that should be told. So I'm delighted to see so many of you here tonight uh, to, to, to watch it, and very much look forward to answering your questions afterwards. Thanks very much indeed for coming. was quite a reception. <laughs> thank you, Anthony, so much for being here. And thank you. thank you for recording what went on, these horrifying events. Um, you talked a bit before the film about how you kind of came to make it. Can you talk a bit more about that and go into more detail about the process of the filmmaking? Yeah, well, it was really a simple thing of wanting to document it. And it didn't really start out that I wanted to make a a feature documentary film at all. I just wanted to document what was happening. And so it evolved, really. I mean, there were moments where I just thought, what am I doing this for? And I didn't really understand it. I mean, I pitched it at various film festival pitching workshops where filmmakers go to try and get funding for projects. And at those pitches, yeah, there was one in Edinburgh that I did at the during the Edinburgh Film Festival where you know, we didn't receive any kind of support at all. And I just thought, I'm just going to continue doing it because I just thought it was important. I didn't know where it was going to end up. Um, 
But I think it was more, I was up there just the other day uh, on the day the golf course opened. Uh, Donald Trump had um, barred me from the, uh, from, the, <laughs> from, the, from the invited media guest list. So I went and I spoke to all the residents and, and I was, <clears throat> you know, just struck again, just how thinking when I met them, that is why I decided to do this really, that these are, are people who just feel very, very passionately about their environment, about the place they live. Um, and they are unlikely environmentalists in a sense. And somebody, you know, had to kind of document that and also make the point about the dunes being so important because I hadn't realized when I set out just how important those dunes were in that they move and shift in a way that no other sand dunes do in Europe. I mean, they are completely unique and they are like a, an outdoor laboratory for scientists uh, to study, but they're also a fantastic open space. And you know, we've said quite a, a lot in interviews with my colleague Richard, the producer, uh, about how this area is one of Britain's last wilderness areas. And some people might think, well, is it really? But it is because it's so special and so unique. And those dunes, once you stabilize them and stop them from moving and shifting, then that scientific interest is gone. And I think it's also a poignant thing for me to think about, you know, the the whole issue that people are so concerned about at the moment when we hear about the banks, when we hear about the media with Rupert Murdoch, all those kind of issues in people's minds at the moment. And here we have in Scotland an example of, you know, the press, uh, the government seemingly and the police all, you know, it's how the local people feel. Anyway, they feel that this has been colluding, uh, you know, th these various elements colluding against them and the environment. And I think it's incredibly important that we, we document that and, and we say this is what happened. Um, what is the situation now that the first golf course has opened? Um, there was a piece in the end of the credits there that he's now saying he might not build a hotel if, there are, uh, if there's an offshore wind farm, which I find hilarious because surely that's a nicer thing to look at than anything he's constructing. How are the residents doing at the moment? Well, you know, Susan Monroe, when I was at her house the other day, the bank of earth is not only outside her front now, it's all around her house. And there is a, now a security gate at the bottom of her garden um, just being put up. It was literally put up overnight. Uh, there is a car park right outside. The clubhouse, which Donald Trump has built, a temporary clubhouse, which um, he doesn't have planning permission for, incidentally, in terms of what has been built there. He's applied for retrospective planning permission for that building and a number of other things that have happened on the site, like these banks of earth, you know. And David Milne, the banks of earth next to his house have uh, disappeared, but they've now put up big trees. They took them away after the film went out, and I think they were kind of alarmed about some of the public response. <laughs> and they put up these big trees, which are, you know, um, just literally plonked in the in the earth. And, and David was saying at the Q&A we did in um, Aberdeen at the Belmont Picture House the other night, just how they're all dying and falling over. And, you know, I asked them, you know, Susan and David both said, when I asked them, how do you feel on the day, you know, the golf course is opening? And they both said, well, it's laughable in a way. Um, I mean, Susan, Susan was, you know, she just says incredible things that I, I've learned to, to just realize and anything that the residents say usually ends up happening. I mean, Michael Forbes was saying to me that, uh, he thought the golf course would be sold within six months. Um, and Molly you know, was saying, oh, it looks, a, it looks a really strange golf course. All those bunkers all together, they're all like together and it just looks really odd. And I could really understand what she was saying because, you know, standing on David, Mil uh, David Milne's um, house and if, every, if any of you are ever driving up that way or, you know, just want to stop off and see any of the residents. I mean, they're incredibly hospitable and they would be delighted, you know, to, to, to meet you. 
And you know, Molly will Did make you a cup of. You're saying this to hundreds they, of people. They, 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 <laughs> but Molly would make you a cup of tea, uh, and she's just delightful. She's she is the, the the grandmother everybody wishes they had. I think. I mean, she's just an extraordinary woman, and she's 89 years old. You know, and just such a, you know, they they, but they were all saying things such as, you know, this will be sold. It's a laughable situation. And they're just so real, these people, you know, and the whole the whole fakeness of everything that's kind of surrounding this whole Trump bandwagon, I think is just, you know, I think people are really seeing through this stuff these days and, they, and it just doesn't wash anymore. Yeah. Hmm. That question was, has Alex Salmon been invited to any of the screenings? Uh, yes, he's been invited to all 50 screenings currently going on. We've done two screenings at the Scottish Parliament, which he's um, declined invitations to attend. Um, you know, I was struck by the fact that he went, we saw a trailer for Brave before this film, and he travelled on a 5,000 mile round trip to go and see Brave. And it struck me that he maybe prefers fantasy to reality, because he has not you know, accepted an invitation to see the film at any opportunity. And I even you know, said this morning there are a couple of tickets reserved if uh, he should wish to come. He's not um, here in disguise, is he? <laughs> now, his personal assistant wrote back and said, well, you know, if you'll send Mr. Salmon a copy of the DVD, uh, I'm sure he'll watch it. But that's not the point. You know, this is his constituency. These people are in his constituency. He has not gone to visit them, and they have made it very plain they would like him to. They have ne he has never gone to visit them. And this was an opportunity for him to come and see public response to the film. And I think that is key to this. I mean, it's one of the things, when we were refused um, television support to, sh to, to make the film for television, I just felt, well, why don't we just go down the cinema route and show it in cinemas? And it's a very powerful thing. I think everybody agrees who's here. You probably all like going to the cinema, as I do. And there's something about seeing, you know, this story collectively and then being able to discuss it in the bar afterwards and having a chat about it. You know, those are all important things. And I think that Mr. Salmon should witness that. And particularly because this is his constituency. I mean, it seems astonishing to me that he has declined all these invitations. But, you know, I hope that he will see it and uh, in a public setting. We did say to him, look, we'll arrange a screening at a time to suit you, but it will be a public screening, you know, and we haven't had a response. What kind of response did you get from other MSPs at the, the screenings you did at the Scottish Parliament? Well, there was, I mean, Mike, uh, my fr good friend Mike Nicholson, who's here, who's been a great support through this whole process, you know, he uh, helped me organise the last screen at the Parliament. We asked all the MSPs to come, and um, we had a smattering of... You know, representations from each party, but it was disappointing turnout, really, from the MSPs. I mean, the, the place was packed, and it was in the committee room just a few hours before Donald Trump came in to say that he is the evidence when it comes to, uh, you know, um, uh, lecturing the Scottish government on um, on renewable energy. Um, you know, he was asked, you know, what evidence do you have uh, against wind farms? He said, I am the evidence. I am the evidence. So he said that in the room, the very room, um, you know, he was talking about his whole record in terms of tourism um, and bringing tourism to the area that his hotels are in. But, you know, the bottom line is, you know, his, his um, development in yeah, Aberdeenshire, which incidentally has 1.8% unemployment, so it's not an economy like in desperate need of being saved by Donald Trump. Uh, this this the, the, this resort in inverted commas, which is essentially now one golf course and a temporary clubhouse, and a few um, maybe two dozen full and part time jobs. Remember, this was a six thousand job, billion pound development that was going to essentially create the second coming of oil for Aberdeen show when it was sort of, and it's still talked about in that ridiculous way by the Evening Express and the Press and Journal newspapers, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Have they reviewed the film, those papers? No, they've blackballed the film. They have not even mentioned uh, the fact that it exists. Um, 
I mean, apart from in the listings of the newspaper when the Aberdeen Belmont Picture House has shown it. But, uh, you know, this film, we were told originally, uh, you won't get funding by Creative Scotland, who incidentally have now supported our, our this distribution. Um, you know, because nobody will watch it, nobody will come and see it. And then we we um, opened it at the Belmont Picture House. All the residents came. We rolled out the green carpet, and they they all came. And it notched up the fastest advance ticket sales since the first Harry Potter film <laughs> in Aberdeen. But still, the Press and Journal and the Evening Express wouldn't cover the story. They refused to send a photographer to, to take pictures of the local residents there, even though it was a, a real moment in history, I thought, seeing them all there together, um, standing up for the environment and saying, this document is important. And they'd never seen it before that evening. And I was really worried about what they would think about it, of course, you know, because it was the first time they'd seen it. So I think you know, it is extraordinary that those newspapers continue to act like a, a PR sheet, in my view, for, for Donald Trump, the Trump Organization. There's a question here. As far as the, um, you know, the groups are concerned, well, the, the one group that was set up to oppose the development, tripping up Trump, um, was, the, was the main group. But I feel very, very disappointed, I have to say, with all the um, groups in Scotland supposed to be um, safeguarding our environment. Because I think that once the Scottish government inquiry had been held, they thought the fight has been lost. And, and I disagree with that. I think that they should have continued to fight um, the, the development and also the decision you know, that had been made, because even though the decision had been made, I still feel very strongly that groups like Friends of the Earth Scotland had a real opportunity to take this development as an example of saying, never again in Scotland should we allow this to happen. Never again will we allow, you know, what the scientists say are the crown jewels of our natural heritage, our equivalent of the Amazon rainforest, to be sold off for a few um, caddy jobs. You know, I mean, it's an extraordinary set of circumstances. And that is what it is. The reality of the situation is that it is not a 6,000 job development. It is one golf course, a temporary clubhouse, a few part-time jobs. And yet still we see the media talking about this as a, all of last week, a 100 million pound golf course. It is not a 100 million pound golf course at all, uh, the figures from Companies House show that the Trump Organization has spent around six million pounds on this golf course, and Mr. Trump spent uh, six million pounds buying the property and the land. Um, so, you know, there's so many um, inaccuracies there. Um, and, and I just think that the, yeah, the, the, the bottom line is there is a real opportunity still for these groups, the, the Royal Society of Protection of Birds, Scottish Wildlife Trust, all of these groups to say that we should not allow this to happen again. And you're going to have to remind me of your second point, which was about the residents. Yeah, the, the land, um, the site of special scientific interest, the Trump Organization says, at every opportunity that only a small fraction of the triple SI has been touched. If you speak to any of the scientists, they say if you, if you destroy even a small part of that, it destroys the whole thing. And the other point to make is that the triple SI, um, all the land surrounding it is just as important, if not more so, according to the scientists. So if you stabilize it, which is what they've done, is move huge amounts of sand all around the site. And then lay out greens. And if you look at the pictures on the news this last week, you'll have seen a golf course. I mean, that's what it looks like. It looks like a golf course with Donald Trump there saying, these dunes are phenomenal, they're amazing, uh, but I'm going to make them even better than, I, than they are, he said at the offset. But he hasn't. He has destroyed the dunes. I mean, that is a fact. I mean, according to every scientific a scientist of, of credible repute in this country, that is what has happened. There's nobody saying, actually, he's done a good job. The clerk of works, uh, which is supposed to keep a watch on this development, is employed by the Trump Organization. So, you know, that gives you an idea of just how much of a watch has been kept on this. Aberdeenshire Council, when the residents complain about these uh, banks of earth being put next to their houses, they don't act. You know, there has been no act, uh, uh, no, no 
action at all from the council. I think it's incredibly um, disheartening to see that still the case. You know, for the residents, they just feel exasperated by it, and I can understand it because you know nothing has changed. And the whole idea of at least trying to get the film out is that we can say to people, this is what's happened. You've read what you've read in the newspapers. You've seen what you've seen on the television. But this is a side of the story that you maybe haven't seen. And then you can make up your own mind. And the whole point of doing this film is to try and get to the truth, to allow people to make up their own minds. And, and I think that's the important thing as we move forward. Um, that was a question about how many of the people working on the golf course are from Aberdeen, are local, and also what was Ant charged with when he was arrested? Yeah, well, the, as far as the local people are concerned working on the golf course, um, when I spoke to the local residents the other day, they said as far as they know, nobody very local is working on the golf course. I mean, there's an Irish contractor who was brought in to, to build the golf course. And, you know, when Donald Trump says in the film, hundreds of people are going to be starting to plant the marron grass, that's a very big project, a very big project. The Sunday Herald did an investigation through Freedom of Information to get figures from the from Grampian police, which showed that uh, a dozen unskilled laborers actually uh, planted the marron grass and also local school children as well. So they were brought in, the local primary school was brought in to, to help um, plant the marron grass, which, you know, if you listen to the scientists, is the worst kind of education for children because this is not what you do to sand dunes of this type. Um, but yet that's what happened. And as far as you know, working on the golf course at the moment, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell. I, there was a jobs fair held in Aberdeen recently. It was, uh, you know, uh, um, they, they said, said publicly we're, we're creating 50 full and part-time jobs. Um, and then, amazingly, you know, all the, all the media in Scotland then ran a story, Donald Trump's bar staff are being trained on how to, um, how to, how to sell whiskey. You know, this was the story. It was everywhere. And I was thinking, well, you know, it's, in other words, to, you know, bar staff are being trained to do their job. But everybody seemed to be thinking that this was an amazing thing that Trump was doing on this golf course in the clubhouse, allowing, you know, that bar staff would be able to sort of tell people the difference between different whiskey, different malts. And, yeah, and, and as we were charged with a breach of the peace, um, which obviously you can go to jail for. Um, and what happened was the police... Um, uh, press that charge. Uh, I was then sent a letter saying that we're going to drop the charge, but um, you'll be on the adult offenders register for two years and have a written warning, which I then challenged. And then so that makes essentially makes the proceedings active again. And then the Crown Office in Scotland threw out the case and the police issued a sort of half bait. Uh, apology after a sort of cover-up whitewash inquiry, according to the National Union of Journalists, which was held just before Christmas by an internal officer at Grampian Police. Is the the head groundsman? Is he still working there? Uh, no, he's not. Paul O'Connor. Yeah, he's a he's, charmer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was an expensive camera as well. You know. Um, yeah. You know, he left. Uh, he left. Um, afterwards uh he was fired and in fact there's some there's some um footage on the on the internet with uh, trump firing paul o'connor and and that's the kind of thing that trump loves to people to see you know i'm getting tough and and essentially you know paul o'connor was 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 fired i don't know whether it was directly related to what happened there because the trump organization put out a statement saying that we had been um, uh, filming secret documents and, uh, in, uh, and, and then the police put out a statement saying that uh, um, th this incident had been independently witnessed, you know, which is utter nonsense. Um, you know, and, and that just again goes to collaborate those thoughts and fears that the locals have, that the police are working you know, as a kind of private security force for Donald Trump. No, there are lots of questions. One here first. Um, I think it's important that people know that this isn't just a local issue. Yeah. Your film was the uh, lead film, the opening film in the San Francisco Green Film Festival. And we, in fact, met there. And as you know, the San Francisco Chronicle had you on the front page. And since Not then, me. Well, they had <laughs> your own front of the film. Thanks on the front page. Yeah, it was actually true. Awesome about it. Yeah. Uh, and the film's been shown throughout America now. Yeah. And I'm surprised that Mr. Salmon isn't aware of how Scotland is a 
disappearing to the rest of the world mm. because I think it's important because I think he ought to be ashamed of Well, I know I appreciate your your comments, and I do think that you know it's an input. You're right when you say this isn't a local issue. I agree with you. I don't think it is a local issue. I think it's an international issue. And as I said at the start, I think that these kind of decisions, which are being made everywhere in the world, you know, resonate with local communities. And in that sense, it's a local issue, but it's an international is of international importance. I mean, we were asked to show the film in Croatia, in Dubrovnik, and um, there a developer is trying to develop this UNESCO protected site uh, where dozens of people were killed in the Bosnian War. Um, and you know the local mayor is backing this project. Everybody's behind it as in the media. And then there are these people who are holding out against it. And, and it's a carbon copy example of what's happened in Scotland. But whether it's a golf course or whatever it is, you're right. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's an example of what's happening everywhere. And I do think you're, I do think that, that Mr. Salmon should watch the film. I think that he should see it in a, in a public place. And we're opening the film. Um, I'm going to New York tomorrow, where we're opening the film on the 3rd of August at the Angelica Film Center in in Manhattan for a week. And this has been after a huge effort on our behalf to get the film uh, distributed in America because Mr. Trump actually doesn't care what people in Scotland think about him, but he certainly does care what people in New York and in Los Angeles where the film is going next think about him. And I think that's why it's so important for us to get the film out into the United States. Okay, there's another question just there. Do I feel the quotes from the golfers, the American golfers at St. Andrews are typical? Yes, I do. Um, you know, that was a, a very, uh, there was not one American golfer we spoke to who didn't, re you know, who did not reiterate that point. And I think, you know, Richard, who is the producer of the film, who is a Canadian um, and lived in Montrose until recently, he's written two books on Lynx Golf. He's a member of the uh, Golf Writers Association of America. He's actually a very, um, very good golfer. And uh, he um, has always said to me that people who come and play golf in Scotland, they come to play heritage courses. They don't want to come and play a Trump course. You know, Americans coming to Scotland want to play St. Andrews, Cruden Bay, Royal Aberdeen. They want to come to the heritage of, of, of golf. The golf was born in Scotland and in Montrose, you got arguably the second golf course, oldest golf course in the world. And it's a really, you know, when my mother played golf, sorry, I sound like Trump again, <laughs> but, but when my mother did play golf and, and her brother Dennis and, and um, you know, her other brother, brother Paddy, they, they grew up right next to the golf course. They went out, it was a, the golf course is part of the town of Montrose. It's common land, it's not a private gated community, it's part of the town. People go and play it um, and pay, you know, I think it's 30 pounds or something like that to play around. Um, you know, Trump is asking 220 pounds for a round of golf, and it's a completely different game. You know, golf has got this kind of elitist tag to it, and it's understandable why when you go and look at all the, the paraphernalia that's for sale and how much people are charging for it in shops. But the, the you know, when Montrose Golf Course was was built in inverted commas 450 years ago, you know, it was essentially just the dunes and people put a couple of holes in the ground and, and chop down the grass. And that was what the golf course was. Whereas you know, Trump's answer to it is to have a Manhattan style building project and move you know, biblical amounts of sand around the side when it's completely unnecessary. And there is a way of producing golf courses in an organic and caring way to the environment. And that's an opportunity he had here, but he chose not to take it just in the same way he had an opportunity to be a good neighbor to his local people, and he chose not to, t to take that opportunity. And it baffles me as to why he, he did not. There's a question over here. Um, yes, I have both a quick comment question. Um, on a positive note, I was staying in Aberdeen at a guest <coughs> house this last weekend. I stayed with two Swedish uh, golfers who had just been invited to play at the Trump, and they much preferred St. Andrews to the Trump. <laughs> that was wonderful news. Um, my question is, as a photojournalism student, how do you 
maintain your calm when you're so passionate and such an advocate. I don't do that very well, and I'd love to know how you do it. <laughs> oh, I don't feel like You know, the thing is, I think, as I was saying earlier, you know, it was, and thank you for your comments, but it, it really felt to me not as if, I think it'd be different if you were setting out to make a film and you were thinking, oh, one day it's going to be in Edinburgh and there's going to be all these people watching it. And it never felt like that to me at all. It felt like a, a, a project of documenting what was happening. And in that sense, um, you know, there were definitely moments. I mean, there've been so many moments where I felt completely um, yeah, upset and found it an incredibly difficult thing to do in, the, in some respects, but that is just, you know, I suppose some of us are more sensitive than others to to these kind of things, and I just found it very, very difficult at times to see the effect it was having on on people who then you know become your friends and and you know they invite you into their homes and trust you to tell their story, but they're essentially these are all the people in the film I count I'm lucky and privileged to count as as friends, you know. And so in a way, you feel as if you are, it was never my intention obviously to be in the film, it was only after the arrest situation that you know, I felt that I, I yeah, had to, in a sense, um, have a, an element of me in it, because otherwise it would have just sort of popped up. And there's also the thing about you know, trying to, as best as I could, I mean, I know I'm no Michael Moore, but I tried to uh, hold Donald Trump to account for, his actions, and nobody else seemed to be. I mean, the, the, the press and journal would ask him a question at a news conference, have you tried Haggis yet, or, uh, you know, um, and it was just astonishing, really, to watch that. And so nobody, it was, uh, you know, one of the new American newspapers described it as, you know, a, uh, the, these news conferences as a softball news conference for Donald Trump, and it seemed to be every single one. And I, the good thing is about the film now, I think, coming out is that there has been some really good journalism done. The Sunday Herald, The Courier, you know, they're both newspapers which have done some work on this story, particularly The Herald, The Sunday Herald, and, and on the environmental issues, which are so important. So, yeah, it was, it, I think it's just an organic y kind of process, really, and it, it evolved. Question right at the back row. I mean, if, if he has given up his idea of a second course and abandoned the hotel and abandoned, has he abandoned all the houses as well? Surely, if he has done that, then you won, or the, the locals have won. Because, I mean, the money was in building the houses. It's not in the, it's not in the golf course. The player who's going to make his billion was in selling houses to Americans and Japanese at a huge cost. And if that has been abandoned, has, it, has he not really conceded lost. defeat? Uh, has, it, has he lost because the houses have been I mean, built. he won't he recoup £12 million pounds on one golf course for that. Well, if you, it, you know, The Economist in the film says, doesn't he, that the getting planning permission alone for 1,500 houses is worth hundreds of millions of pounds probably just to get the planning permission. And that's the point because the planning permission is to the land, not to the person. So Donald Trump can quite happily sell that land on with its planning permission and Stuart Milne can come in and build 1,500 houses. So that's one thing. I mean, I think you know, the hotel um, always struck me as a bizarre economic, I mean, I don't know, you know the business of running hotels, but I do know the, the plan originally had a hostel for 450 people to, to live in, which it, I'm sure in Edinburgh, as I say, in Montrose, the local hotels, uh, you know, most of the jobs are taken by Eastern European people because the locals don't want to do those jobs because they're minimum wage jobs. And that was, you know, what the Trump organization wanted was to bring in people working on the minimum wage. And, you know, it's a sad state of affairs, but that is the reality of running hotels in Scotland. They are not big, well-paid jobs, you know, serving drinks to wealthy Americans flying across the Atlantic to play a few rounds of golf and then flying back again. And that was the premise of the economic, you know, boom, supposedly. But essentially what we have now is one golf course, a temporary clubhouse, and none of the economic benefits that were promised. And so in that sense, you know, 
the local people have scored a victory because it does look as if Donald Trump is going to walk away when the wind farm is given the go-ahead, which it undoubtedly will be. Um, but you know, remember, Donald Trump, first of all, said, I'm not going to build a hotel because of Michael Forbes' farm. It's a pigsty. Then he said, I'm not going to build a hotel when he spoke to Severin Carell, the Guardian Scotland correspondent. He said, I'm not going to build a hotel because of the economic downturn. And now he's saying, I'm not going to build a hotel because of the wind farm. And he will undoubtedly walk away. And it, as I said, yeah, Michael Forbes and the other residents, nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, what they say turns out to be true. And when Michael Forbes said, you know, he reckons the, the golf course will, will be up for sale in six months, so I would, I would be very surprised if it wasn't. Yeah, but even if that happens and Stuart Mill rises, I mean, Trump hasn't been defeated. Because, I mean, here's <coughs> the way, I mean, yeah. his, his plan for making He has, but he has been defeated. But let's remember as well that the site of, spy, site of special scientific interest has been lost, and that's the you know in a way you're right. You know he the hotel won't have been built, and the but the environmental damage has been done. The land has been you know tarnished and destroyed. I mean, And the weather, the weather will, will as, as the, How was the weather on the opening day? As Karin day? says in her song, you know, the ha will stumble in. Was, was the weather nice for his uh, opening? It was a drie day, <laughs> and it was, it was and, and, and when I got up there, Susan said, oh, I'm loving this, Anthony, the rain's on. I've been doing my rain dance all morning. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one more question. There's one down here. Has the man still got his garage? And secondly, do you think the resistance might have been greater? decision been taken by a British government in London as opposed to the Scottish government in Edinburgh. So has David Milne still got his garage? The answer is yes, um, and he hasn't settled the bill either for the, <laughs> for the fence. Um, and, you know, do I think if the decision, if the project had been given the go-ahead in London, the, the outcry would have been greater? Well, I think there is, you know, part of me, I have to say, sadly, I think, you, you know, it may have been only in the sense that you know, we've seen the outcry, for example, with the third runway at Heathrow and the, um, you know, the, the campaign of force that was shown there. I was amazed when I went up on the day the bulldozers moved into the many estate. It was on all the news bulletins in the morning. The, the Trump organ, you know, Trump has started work on his golf course. The bulldozers have moved in. There was not one. So I was just there with my camera. I was expecting to find a few people up there saying, you know, this shouldn't be allowed, and there wasn't. And and, it, and I don't understand. I have to say why that is the case here. I don't know whether it's because people didn't really know where it was. You know, in terms of driving at how far, how long it would take to get there, or. It just seemed extraordinary. I just felt frustrated by that because I do think you know the march of many that you see was a was a successful um, demonstration of force. Of the, you know, hundreds of people turning out and and you know showing their support for people that the Trump organization has called a national embarrassment for Scotland. You know, the local residents as they as, as they've been branded by the Trump organization. And I think that the show support there was really great and a great boost to the residents and there was a coach that came up from glasgow and but when i think of how scotland rallied behind the sort of anti-war marches and you know uh during the iraq build up to the iraq war i i i don't quite understand it's almost as if there wasn't, I think it's partly because people still don't quite understand because they haven't been told by the media just how important this land and these dunes are. And they were also being given completely ill-informed um, you know, statements from the local residents. And these people, I thought when I listened to the news that Michael Forbes was this guy who lived in a shack, um, you know, on the dunes and he was just being, 
a pain because he was standing in the way of development. I thought, well, that's, you know, she should just move on, surely. And then I went up and I spoke. I just couldn't believe the difference, you know, of meeting uh, Michael and Sheila and Molly and, and all the residents of just what, you know, extraordinary people they are, salt of the earth, kind of people that I think are a real credit to Scotland and a real inspiration to hundreds of people around the world who have seen them and and believe that the the organized you know the Trump organization statement about them being an embarrassment is so could not be further from the truth these people are just extraordinary and you know they have they have stood up for as Ma as Martin Ford the the green councillor says in the film they knew the difference between right and wrong and they've stood on the side of right and I think they they are an extraordinary group of people that we can all learn lessons from I'm afraid that is all we have time for tonight. Sorry if you didn't get your question in. Happy to answer more. In we'll the be in the bar. bar. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Anthony. Well, I think the main thing is just to have a story that you want to tell and then just set out to try and tell it and not to let you know people persuade you otherwise that it's an important um if you've got a, a point that you want to make and i mean the point about the media um not necessarily telling the story that you want it to tell means that you have an opportunity yourself mm -hmm to go out and try and tell the story that you want to tell. And you know, part of the whole thing now with um, cameras, with uh, digital technology and being able to edit something on a laptop allows us to do that and to get a story and a message out there very quickly. And I think it's important that we just follow our hearts to a certain degree and we just try and tell the story without letting uh, you know, real worries about, which are genuine worries about funding, how we're going to fund the film and all those kind of things, but doing something quite quickly and getting it out there I think is an important thing.